constitutes an identity. Our jobs, our values, our passions, who we love. For someone like me, who is almost a completely different person today than who I was just a few short years ago, I struggle to define myself. But here's what I've come up with so far. I am a lover of people, a proud nerd, an accomplished academic, and drug user. I am a drug user, and opioids are my drug of choice. This is my story. Nearly four years ago, my life changed in a big way. I had just gone into grad school at the University of Toronto and was doing my best to keep up with my new environment. At the time, I had gone from serving tables at a local restaurant to now spending several hours a day studying the inner workings of brain cells, something I knew really nothing about. I didn't have a very comprehensive background in science, not like my peers did at least. So while my colleagues were full steam ahead running their experiments, I was playing catch up with my head in the textbooks trying to learn basic terms. Grad school stressed me out, mostly because I couldn't keep up with the expectation that in a matter of only a few years, I was to become an expert on something I didn't even grasp the fundamentals of. So I coped with my stress, the only way I knew how, working out. Lifting weights was a longtime passion of mine, and the rush that came along with pushing myself to my limits was truly therapeutic for venting my frustration and stress. And so as my days at the lab got longer, so did my nights at the gym. And I'd often spend two or three hours working out, sometimes back to back for days in a row. I was the strongest I've ever been. With such frequent and intense workouts, I was used to feeling sore pretty much all the time. But I had started to notice something very different about the way my body was acting. First, I noticed pain in my back. And it wasn't the muscle soreness that I was used to. This was pain. And it wasn't going away after workouts. I also found myself to be way more fatigued than I ever was before. And whereas my friends only needed a day or two to get back to the gym, I needed several, sometimes weeks off just to recuperate. At first, I wasn't worried and figured I was probably just experiencing an injury maybe brought on by the stress of grad school. So I stopped working out. But as weeks turned into months of 24 seven around the clock pain, I grew increasingly more concerned. Eventually enough time had passed that I was realizing that I was staring down the path of chronic pain, a very dark path, path often with no return, a path I was familiar with because I had seen someone walk it before, my own father, when he was left in debilitating neuropathic chronic pain following a stroke. I had seen what chronic pain could do to someone and I was terrified that I was next because I wasn't sure I could survive. So I did everything in my power to fix my situation. I made lifestyle changes moved downtown onto campus so I wouldn't have to tote around a heavy backpack and commute. I got a new mattress. I was relentless with physio and chiropractic work, did plenty of massage and even tried naturopathy. My room filled up with contraptions, some which hung me from my feet, others that stretched me out thin, and my closet became a clutter place of rolling balls and exercise mats, heating pads. I got every supplement I could find on the internet. I tried every topical. I even read every book I could find on healing my back pain with my mind. But it was all to no avail. As my savings dwindled, my desperation peaked. All the while, only one thing remained true and constant in my life. Pain. And it was getting worse. After about a year, the pain had spread, first from my back into my shoulders and neck, and then into my arms and legs until my entire body was enveloped. By that point, nearly every muscle ached, and every joint throbbed. 
mundane tasks that I took for granted became near impossible. Things like going for a walk or going up a flight of stairs were tough because my back was in so much pain it couldn't hold itself up. My feet would seize up and I would be left bedridden for days, barely able to make it to the washroom just down the hall. Even my hands became so sore and my knuckles so stiff that texting was painful. These daily tasks that were nothing before were leaving me in agony. Even sleep was eventually taken from me and most of my nights were spent balled up on the floor, writhing in pain, usually over a, a roll, roll or a ball, waiting for the sun to come up while the rest of the world slept. Showers became nothing more than a hiding place, a place of camouflage, somewhere I could go and rest my head against the cold tile and cry, hoping that no one would hear me over the sounds of the water droplets hitting the floor. By my second year of grad school, I was inconsolable. Life had gone on in the background, and family events and birthdays flew by without me hardly noticing. Yet, what was only a two-year anniversary of chronic pain felt like a lifetime. I felt like I was living life on repeat in the worst way, like I was going through a groundhog day from hell. I had all of the opportunities of the world in front of me, yet was too broken to reach for them. Along the way, my days became less of looking at brain cells through the microscope and more of watching the clock in the waiting room of various doctor's offices. Doctors all agreed that something was very wrong, that I had some disease, but they couldn't agree on a diagnosis. And in the meantime, my life was hanging in the balance, literally. Finally, I got to see a pain specialist who, unbeknownst to him, was my last hope. I'll never forget our first consultation. After we met and I told him about my condition, we shook hands and he showed me to the door. But before I left, I stopped and asked him a question that had been on my mind for months. I asked if this ever gets better, desperately clinging on to the hope that perhaps this could be fixed. And he looked at me with as much compassion as helplessness. And he said, no, this is for life. You're a chronic pain patient now. I booked it out of his office, feeling my heart race and my eyes well up. I made it to my car where I locked the door and I punched the steering wheel over and over again and I wept. I didn't know if I had been handed a life sentence or a death sentence. I didn't know how long it would be until I couldn't go on anymore. I didn't know how long it would be until I would be in that car seat again, crying over the steering wheel with the window rolled down and the car running in the garage. When we injure pain, there's only one coping mechanism at our disposal. The notion that pain is temporary. That's how we get through, knowing that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. But what happens when there is only darkness? What happens when suffering knows no end? What happens when that coping mechanism is robbed from us? How long can the human spirit endure before it is fundamentally shattered? How long could I have gone on before I could on no more? With my pain doctor beside me, I started the long and exhausting road of medicating, first with only a few drugs, but then several. As if grad school wasn't hard enough, I was now dealing with a constantly changing cocktail of drugs and all the side effects that came along with them. But I bit my tongue and I didn't complain because I was desperate to get better. But still, Dozens of drugs later, nothing worked. And things came to a head again when I went back to my doctor's office and let him know that my will to live was hanging by a damn thread. It was only then, after we had tried everything else, that he made a call that would eventually change my life forever. He prescribed me opioids. 
I went home with that prescription in hand that night and I thought about all of the things I had worked for and how they were now at risk for being destroyed. I was terrified of these drugs. I didn't want to be a statistic of overdose. I didn't want to be found shooting heroin on the street. But this was not a choice to be made. This was survival. And with that in mind, I popped the cap, I double checked the label, and I took the pill. Life on opioids caught me by surprise. I was sure I would be groggy and unmotivated and fatigued as I had been for months before, but it was the opposite. I had energy, I was alive, I was happy. The pain was still there, but it was quieter. It was like the chains had been loosened, just enough. Just enough to sleep, just enough to eat, just enough to live. I was able to pick up the pieces of my previous self and rebuild a new normal. A new normal that let me get back to work and finish my degree and win scholarships of the provincial and national level along the way, mentor students, and even get back to working out. But my success was short-lived. It wasn't long before I became well acquainted with the problems of opioids. I stopped working. I felt my fears creeping back in knowing I didn't have a backup plan, but luckily my doctor did. For example, he introduced me to opioid rotation, which essentially capitalizes on the limited tolerance and of the opioid class and by switching or rotating between various uh, opioid drugs at equivalent doses, a patient can maintain sensitivity for a prolonged period of time. Opioid rotation has been a massive asset in my recovery, but it hasn't been everything. Because as it turns out, dose sensitivity is only a small part of a much bigger problem. Rather, the inability to get a effective dose posed a much greater threat to my pain management. In response to the opioid epidemic, gone are the days of gradually increasing doses over time in order to try and combat the inevitable tolerance which occurs. Instead, the Canadian government implements strict restrictions on the maximum dose a patient may receive, irrespective of their pain level or condition. The problem is that this dose is simply too low for many patients, including myself, who even at the maximum dose will not find adequate pain relief whatsoever. Nearly all others will reach opioid tolerance so quickly that they will have nowhere else to run thereafter. Doctors must adhere to these guidelines or risk having their practice taken away from them, and thus they cannot dose as they see needed. Ultimately, this leads to prescription of other medications, many which do not show strong effects for pain management, in order to try and compensate for the few opioids they may prescribe. This leaves pain patients who are already suffering to deal with the side effects of polypharmacy, much like I had to. What's worse is this has created a massive divide amongst patients who were grandfathered into opioid therapy people like my father, and those of us who came later, people like myself. To give you an idea of the discrepancy between these two groups, the maximum dose a patient may receive is 90 milligrams of morphine. This is the dose that I'm at now and will stay at for the rest of my life, even when this dose completely stops working, which it almost has. Yet, my father will receive a dose that is 15 times that amount for the rest of his life. Think about that. The opioid cap was introduced to try and protect those who would potentially succumb to the dangers of the opioid epidemic, but it has only created bigger problems. Opioid prescriptions continue to make their way to the street where they are abused. And yet the street has only become a more attractive option for a desperate pain patient looking to seek relief. While the opioid epidemic continues to rage on, a second opioid crisis has formed. One that you are not aware of, but that I am. One where thousands of patients are left empty-handed. 
While some people are dying of opioid overdose, others are left to suffer with opioid inadequacies. This is an example of stigma permeating law. The notion that a blanket restriction must be put in place to protect the lives of those who decide to abuse their drugs is akin to the war on drugs effect on medical cannabis users. The parallels are clear. A drug that is abused by some gets restricted for all. Pain is dynamic, and thus our treatment ought to be as well. There are infinite diseases, conditions, and injuries, all can which cause different levels of pain, types of pain, and frequency of pain. If this is true, then we need to adjust our system because a blanket solution that we have now is not a solution at all. We cannot continue to allow responsible chronic pain patients to pay for the acts of the reckless. Anything less than an individualized approach to managing pain is cruel and inhumane. But it doesn't have to be this way. There is a solution here in addressing both of the opioid epidemics responsibly. Integration of opioid rotation, frequent use of drug testing, blacklisting those who do abuse drugs, and using psychiatric evaluations before prescribing to assess risk of abuse are only some of the ways that we can address the opioid epidemic without punishing those who rely on these drugs to survive. At the very least, we as a society must rethink these drugs and destigmatize them and not always understand them as being toxic and poisonous, but as therapeutic and life-saving for those who are left no choice but to suffer with pain for the rest of their life through no fault of their own. At first glance, I may not seem like your average drug user, but in many respects, I am. I am not an anomaly. I am only one of millions of patients who are suffering in pain and just trying to live a responsible, normal life. We are all around you, but because pain is silent, society remains non-privy to our suffering. Yet we are losing access to our only lifelines, desperately waiting for someone to throw us a rope. Thank you.